Welcome and uh, thank you for joining us at tonight's event, COVID in Queens, Public Trust and Justice. I'm Kavita Sivramakrishnan, Associate Professor of Social Medi Sociomedical Sciences at the Mailman School of Public Health. I have the honor of uh, serving as the Interim Director for the Center for Science and Society. I want to especially start by thanking and welcoming our co-sponsors, the Columbia University Department of African American and African Diaspora Studies for their support, as well as the many groups across Columbia and New York City who have helped us to disseminate word about this fantastic event. Before, you, before we start, I want to start uh, by telling you a little bit about the Center for Science and Society. One of our primary goals at the center have been to organize cross-disciplinary conversations, such as the one you will hear tonight. Uh, the Center for Science and Society brings together researchers, scholars, and practitioners in the social and natural sciences, in the humanities, in law, in medicine, and the arts. And uh, we engage them together, really, to consider questions of interdisciplinary research, teaching, as well as outreach. The center aims to break down traditional academic silos, to develop new kinds of integrative paradigms, and really to build new kinds of training and collaboration. And uh, our focus has always been to enhance public understandings of science in relation to pressing and critical social concerns, such as the ones we'll be talking about today. We do this at the center in several ways. We do this through research. We have seven research clusters on a variety of cross-disciplinary research topics. We also give grants. The center provides seed grants for a variety of student-led projects. Um, and also, uh, over the past year, the center has actually awarded about $150,000 in grants, mostly to uh, students, to public outreach events. We're also involved in a great deal of programming. We organize, sponsor, and host more than almost 40 interdisciplinary events through the years. And um, we also uh, aim to really mobilize a range of not only Columbia University faculty and students, but also to mobilize across the community. If you aren't already subscribing to our mailing list, I encourage you to sign up to be uh, notified of online events, uh, the events that we'll be planning for the remainder of the year. There's a link posted in the chat section of your Zoom console, which is located at the bottom of the Zoom screen. This event really connects to the Center for Science and Society's fifth anniversary theme. This is the fifth anniversary year for our society. And the theme has been knowledge and access. And this event has really been part of a series of events on science, health, and public trust. And we plan to continue these events in the coming fall. This past Earth Day, we had a panel on climate, environment, and the politics of public trust, which is available through our YouTube channel. Uh, tonight's event will also be recorded and available on YouTube. Our hashtag for the event tonight is hashtag COVID in Queens. A uh, brief word really before we kickstart the entire event uh, regarding the format of the event tonight. If you have a question that you would like to ask one or all of the panels, please send it to us on the Q&A feature located at the bottom of the screen. If you're on a smaller device like a phone, you may need to locate the more section at the bottom of the screen to find the Q&A. Type in your question at any point. We'll be monitoring the Q&A and we'll save some time towards the end to have a range of exciting uh, questions that are posed by the audience to our panelists. We are really honored to organize this event with Dr. Samuel Kelton Roberts, a member of the Center for Science and Societies Faculty Steering Committee and a research cluster leader at the Center for Science Society. He will be moderating the conversation tonight. Samuel Kelton Roberts, PhD, is Columbia University Associate Professor of History, Sociomedical Sciences, and African American and African Diaspora Studies. At Columbia, Dr. Roberts leads the research cluster for the historical study of race, inequality, and health. He writes and lectures widely about black politics, history, and public health, especially issues pertaining to public health. And he's the author of the widely acclaimed book, Infectious Fear, Politics, Disease, and the Health Effects of Segregation that was published by the University of North Carolina Press in 2009. Dr. Roberts's current research is a book titled, To Enter a Society Which Doesn't Want Them, Race, Recovery, and America's Misadventures in Drug Policy, uh, tracing addiction politics from the late 1940s to the mid 1980s, a period which encompasses the first post-war opioid epidemics, early therapeutic communities, the maintenance of methadone maintenance, 
the birth of methadone maintenance, drug laws as a part of the carceral state, and finally, the advent of harm reduction and syringe exchanges. He serves on a number of organizational, advisory, executive, and editorial boards, and is also a founding member of the Black Harm Reduction Network. Roberts is also the host of the Public Health and Social Justice podcast, PDIS, People Doing Interesting Stuff. It's a very exciting podcast. Please do connect to it and the co-host of Black Lives in the Era of COVID-19. They're both available on podcast platforms. Dr. Roberts tweets from at Samuel K. Roberts. Welcome, Sam. Welcome, Samuel Roberts. Welcome, Professor Samuel Roberts. It's a huge honor to have you. Thank you so much, Kavita. Uh, thank you to the center. Thank you for the Department of African and African American, uh, or African American and African Diaspora Studies. And most, uh, most importantly, thank you to our welcome guests both serving on the panel and those of you who are in our virtual audience, welcome to all of you. <clears throat> we hope that we are meeting you uh, in, in good spirits and, and, and healthy and well. <clears throat> it's my pleasure to, uh, to join and in, in, in be a part of this conversation <laughs> with uh, four very esteemed guests. And uh, as you know, in March of this year, New York City along with Seattle emerged as one of the epicenters of the US COVID-19 epidemic. The New York Borough of Queens was particularly hard hit. And two of its adjacent neighborhoods, Corona and Elmhurst, together quickly established themselves as the epicenter of the epicenter, quote unquote, and one of the so-called hotspots in the global pandemic. Of the 15 zip codes in New York City with the highest COVID-19 case and death rates as of the 20, uh, 29th of June, Eastern and Southern Queens contributed eight in each category, eight of the top 15. The reason soon became clear. A large proportion of the area's workers of the immigrant working class and employed in occupations, which we later would find out would be deemed essential. Working in health and personal care as drivers and deliverers of goods and as grocery store workers, among others. As such, they risked serial exposures in the line of work, which they could not afford to leave. And Eastern and Southern Queens was not a microcosm of health and inequality in New York, but instead an illustration of the problem writ large. Even before the pandemic, many families in Elmhurst and South Corona existed at the edge of need. The area has an average annual household income of roughly $47,000, but 20% live at or below the federal, uh, federal poverty line, which is $20,000 per household. The federal poverty line is exceptionally low, in fact, especially in cities like New York. And last year, the Citizens Committee for Children of New York, also known as the Triple C, CCC, noted that a better estimate of the poverty line in New York City was roughly 200% of the federal poverty line, that's to say $40,000, in which case fully 52% of the families in Elmhurst were living in that condition. Meanwhile, Queens has 1.5 hospital beds per 1,000 people compared to 5.3 beds in Manhattan. The disparity is not explained by less need in Queens, but it's, but it's populace's ability to pay. Nothing more complicated than that. A higher proportion of hospital patients in Queens are what professionals in the healthcare industry unfortunately call quote unquote unfavorable payer mix. In comparison to their private counterparts, public healthcare institutions like Elmhurst Hospital, which is one of the city's 11 public hospitals, are more dependent on government funding and have fewer resources. <clears throat> Even our mayor, Bill de Blasio, had to admit in mid-May that areas such as Elmhurst long had existed in the absence of truly adequate medical attention, which not only could have mitigated COVID-19 rates, but also could have better treated the endemic predisposing conditions, including hypertension, asthma, and diabetes, found so prevalently, so prevalently in many of the city's low-income communities. <clears throat> this is a quote from our mayor. So many people we lost never had the opportunity to have even the basics of high quality health care, and that underlies this whole crisis, end quote. But I want to be clear today that we did not invite our four illustrious speakers or you, our audience, simply to talk about need in Queens. Quite the opposite. I would personally make the argument that the borough of Queens, especially its Elmhurst Corona community, may be the most interesting place in the country in the context of COVID-19 and even beyond that, and that's for several reasons. Take just for an example, one of the country's dominant political narratives of COVID-19 has highlighted right-wing pandemic denialism 
in the form of refusable, refusal to mask up, demands for businesses to reopen, and Donald Trump's racist deployment of infectious fear to portray the virus as a Chinese plot against America. Less covered in our media is the fact that Elmhurst, Corona, and Jackson Heights, among other neighborhoods in that borough, constitute literally the most ethnically and linguistic, linguistically diverse census districts in the country. Elmhurst itself is roughly 50% East and South Asian and 40% Latinx. With their own, and they have their own histories of cooperation and mutual support, especially in times of need. Another dominant narrative of COVID-19 has been that of the heroic hospital doctor or nurse, and not, you know, unrightfully so. However, while these two professions certainly deserve our praise and support, we must be aware that they are but two of the many professional roles to be found in healthcare. Even in hospitals, physicians and nurses are supported and outnumbered by orderlies, by maintenance and janitorial staff, by medical technicians, by clerical workers, the list goes on. Even among physicians and nurses themselves, there are hierarchies. Higher paid physicians and advanced practice registered nurses, also known as APRNs, enjoy higher relative status within a hospital than nurses' aides and assistants, for example. Indeed, Elmhurst and its adjacent neighborhoods are the home to a large number of the more lower paid healthcare professionals who work in our city's hospitals and also in senior care or in disability services. There are so many more complicated but equally heroic stories which could be told if we were to center our analysis on the problem of labor differentials in the healthcare sector. And finally, we need to acknowledge the area's vibrant political history and its future promise. Two of our guests respectively represent community empowerment organizations with decades of history of work in policy advocacy, education, and resource distribution. Our other two guests represent not just some of the best and most progressive ideas in Albany, but also provide vocal and visible examples for progressive politics in state houses across the country. So yes, we are here today to talk about how it was that Queens became the geographic symbol for structural vulnerability and medical neglect viscerally highlighted by a global pandemic. But I want again to be clear that is just as important, uh, that just as important are the ways in which that borough and its many communities provide us hopeful examples of how we do politics in the future after the pandemic, and yes, after the election of November 2020. That's as good a place as any to bring to you or present to you our wonderful panel of speakers. I will introduce them in alphabetical order. <clears throat> our first is Jeff Aubrey, who uh, of the 35th um, AD of Queens County was elected to the New York State Assembly in a special election on January 3rd, 1992. Assemblyman Aubrey presents presently is the New York State Speaker pro tempore and member of the following committees, Ways and Means, Rules, Social Services, and Governmental Employees. He also serves as a chairman of the Board of Justice Center, a national organization that provides technical assistance to states, uh, technical assistance to states to develop data-driven consensus supported criminal justice policies to reduce crime and decrease the cost of incarceration nationwide. Assemblyman Aubrey is a member of the Council of State Governments and is a Toll Fellow, a distinguished association of state legislators from across the country. Mr. Aubrey serves as the new chair of the New York State Black, Puerto Rican, Hispanic, and Asian Legislative Caucus. Uh, he is a member of the New York State Association of Black and Puerto Rican Legislators Incorporated and a member of the New York State Assembly Senate Puerto Rican Hispanic Task Force. He is a recipient of numerous awards that recognize his commitment to his long commitment to public service. Next in alphabetical order is Saida Leslie Dunstan, who was appointed as the Executive Director of Elm Corps Youth and Adult Activities Incorporated some six years ago in August 2014. Dunstan is recognized among her peers and human service providers throughout New York State and beyond as having a wealth of programmatic administrative knowledge in developing and implementing culturally competent programs and services. Ms. Dunstan works from an anti-racist, anti-poverty lens and has devoted her career to channeling and directing her commitment to service as well as the promotion of inter and intra-agency collaborations around issues of behavioral health, health equity, social and economic justice, anti-stigma, and community education. Next in alphabetical order is 
the center uh, or senator, senator, state senator Jessica Ramos, often referred to as the epicenter of the epicenter. Uh, New York State Senator Jessica Ramos represents the communities of Queens, New York City, hit hardest by the COVID-19 outbreak. Senator Ramos has introduced key statewide legislation to protect vulnerable people by enhancing workforce safeguards and to create a worker bailout fund by taxing the annual wealth gains of billionaires. We will talk to her a bit more about this uh, in our discussion today. Ramos also worked with upstate farmers forced to destroy their crops due to the pandemic and also local vendors struggling to make ends meet and created a delivery pipeline to provide food to needy families in New York City facing the pain of the ongoing hunger crisis. Finally, in alphabetical order, we're pleased to have with us Renetta Citroen, who has a 25 year track record of breaking down barriers and creating opportunities that rebalance power and access for those that have been locked out. She began her career as a youth organizer in the Bronx where she grew up. She navigated her way through international development work, but was pulled back to our city to serve her own community for whom there were no culturally or linguistically accessible programs. Ms. Citron is currently executive director of Chaya Community Development Corporation, a housing and economic justice organization serving Indo-Caribbean and South Asian New Yorkers. She previously worked as director for policy and advocacy at United Neighborhood Houses. Executive Director, where she served as Executive Director of South Asian, Youth, South Asian Youth Action, also known as SAYA, and spent five years at the International Youth Foundation. Herself a Guyanese immigrant, Citroen holds advanced degrees in political science and international political economic, uh, economic um, development. She is on the board of the New York Immigration Coalition and serves as a New York City engagement, New York City Civic Engagement Commissioner. Uh, this would be the moment where we all, where we all uh, meeting in person, I would ask our audience to give a warm welcome, but you could just imagine yourself doing that. You may clap with your muted microphones for this wonderful panel. Before we begin, I would like to also say that uh, you may follow the Columbia Center for Science and Society. Their Twitter handle is at Columbia, C-S-S, C-O-U-L-M-B-I-A-C-S-S. Uh, the Instagram handle is CSSAT, C O L U M B I A, and Facebook is at Columbia CSS. Our hashtag this evening is simply COVID in Queens. All right. Welcome, all of you. I think, can we uh, take everybody off of mute if we can? I'm going to ask each of you, in that order in which I introduced you, to take just a few minutes to talk to us a bit about the work that you were doing, let's just say February, March 1st, 2020, before all of this really hit, um, and how your work has had to change in response to the crisis. If you might just, by way of an introduction, tell us a bit about what you do, what you have been doing for the past uh, few months. Uh, we can start with you, Jeff. We might need to take you off. Uh... Unmute. Uh, I am unmuted. So thank you so much, uh, Sam, for the introduction. All I can else add to that is that a lot of those posts are called past chairs, not present. Uh, there are things that I have uh, done in my past, but I'm not currently holding some of those positions. So um, I don't want folks to believe that I'm uh, so multi-talented that I can be a chair of all of the organizations that were were uh, identified. I but, and I apologize, Jeff. I, and I have to admit, I was wondering. I said, when does this gentleman sleep if he's doing all this? So thank <laughs> you for the correction. And I apologize. Thank no, you. No, no problem. I think someone probably sent you a uh, outdated bio, um, and I apologize for that because I'm sure it was done from my side, not yours. No worries so, at all. March one. We were preparing for the budget of the state of New York, uh, anticipating already that we would be facing a deficit. Um, and that process already included many um, difficult choices that had to be made in order to uh, bring in a balanced budget as best as we could given the three-part 
discussion that we had, the Senate, the, uh, the governor and the assembly. So that we were already engaged in that preparation, looking at submissions from the, the various agencies that were given to us through our hearings of the ways and means hearings that we have, just part of the technical way in which we do it. And then, of course, comes uh, COVID, comes the, the onset of the disease, which begins to clearly identify the kinds of even more dramatic financial impacts that would be had as we had to move to shut down an economy in this state and to uh, begin to have people stay at home, not go to work, businesses closed down that only exacerbated the deficit that we saw, which was again already uh, some $6 billion at least, um, and was quite frankly presenting us with some really disastrous choices, particularly in the, in the Medicaid budgets uh, that we were um, certainly known was going to be a, an, an attack position uh, by the governor and other members uh, seeking to balance our budget. And so we went into that mode, which quite frankly transferred into a virtual gathering of the, the houses, assembly and the Senate um, uh, and ways in which we were going to protect not only our communities, but the members coming up um, to Albany and ultimately ending up with a totally virtual meeting first time in the history of the state. So we had all of that going on at a governmental level. We had emergency powers that were necessary to give to the governor in order to conduct our business. We created a budget that was going to be looked at in component parts over the year based on what kind of assistance we were gonna get from the federal government and when. Um, and we are still in that process. And at the same time, we're drawn back to our communities who particularly are the communities that I represent and Senator Ramos represents, which were suffering food insecurity and health insecurity so that we engage as all of us in the business of trying to make sure that food pantries were operating. Some thousands of people would come every day we had one uh, in order to be able to eat and thousands of masks and sanitizers that we were able to bring to the community as a part of the fight of COVID. we clearly needing to drive down and understanding the need to drive down the rate of infection and of course the accelerating number of people who showed up with the, the disease at Elmhurst Hospital so that it became the, the hospital du jour, so to speak, of fighting COVID for a while in not only in Queens and the city of New York, but the country. And so our, our world rapidly tumbled from where we were to that on the ground existence that was required in order to help our neighborhoods, our neighbors, our friends and family combat this awful uh, pandemic that we were facing. And that many of us, and I always mention this, lost a, a large number of personal friends given my, my age in life and my physical condition in life, lost them to the disease, some who were very close to us and so, without being able to console families directly or to grieve directly, our community uh, struggled with all of these elements. Thank you so much, Assemblyman Aubrey. Can we go next to Ms. Saida Dunstan? Good evening, everyone. Um, first, I wanna say good evening to community. Um, I know it's kind of weird. We're in this uh, virtual world and 
when we're talking to community folks as community organizers, it's really important that we speak directly to the people. So I wanna make sure that I say good evening to those in the virtual world that we can't see. I uh, also wanna thank um, Dr. Roberts and all of those at Columbia University for inviting us. Um, uh, it's important that I thank Anita, Anetta, I apologize, I messed it up because we've been talking too quickly. Anetta as a colleague and someone who understands the um, painstaking reality of being a nonprofit leader right now during COVID and to Senator Ramos and Assemblyman Aubrey, as always, you know, much love because I think the title of this particular panel today is very important about the public trust and justice. And so um, if community can't work with elected officials, we erode at the idea of public trust. And I can honestly say this without hesitation. And those who know me know I'm not a brown noser because I come for anybody anywhere. Um, <laughs> Senator Ramos and Assemblyman Aubrey are definitely the type of folks that you can call on in a crunch. I know that I called on them several times at the very onset of this, and I call on them before that. And I think it's important to say that in the idea of public trust, where we were March 1st and where we are now. As a nonprofit, um, Elm Corps has been, and I will say more as a community organizing outfit, Elm Corps has been in existence since um, 1965. So this year is our 50th anniversary. Um, Jeff humbly um, hangs out around us, not because he wants to, but because he loves us. And he loves us because he was also the executive director at Elm Corps in the 80s, which speaks to the idea of what happens in community when it builds its leadership to then move on to provide other levels of leadership within the state. Um, but that's kind of what Elm Corps is and always was. It's a community organizing outfit that started 50 plus years ago during either the civil rights movement or the black power movement, depending on how you choose to describe it. I always say it's the black power movement because I believe only an empowered community could create a organization that could still survive the type of systemic racism that means that organizations like Elm Corps should not exist. Um, and so it's important in the idea of public trust when you say where we were, we were the little engine that could that most people didn't recognize. I know another can relate to that, nonprofits and um, community organizing outfits that are run by people of color for people of color are not the ones that are typically called on by universities like Columbia to have these kinds of conversation. And so where we are post March 1st, I think we get more phone calls. We talked about this a little bit before, the amount of panels we're on, the amount of conversations we're having, but it's really a reflection of the fact that our community was already under-resourced, underserved, and ignored, um, including those of us who work in the community. And so what we've seen with COVID is just really a reflection of the fact that now we're being seen. And so for us, COVID and the things that we saw, um, Jessica knows because we work together closely with the food pantry. Jeff knows he's worked with us with the food pantry. It was a food insecure community way before COVID. Um, so it wasn't like a shock that once COVID happened and then people lost their jobs, Queens still has a higher um, unemployment rate than the rest of the city, even post COVID, right? And so these are not new things. These are not things that just happened. Um, so where we were before is where we are now. I could say as a community organizing outfit, we're just able to engage more people, have more conversations about the fact that our communities have been suffering, that health disparities has been existing, that undocumented individuals are so afraid because of policy, because of ICE, that sometimes they won't engage with services, that a nonprofit that's been around for 55 years has to work doubly as hard to get our communities to trust that we're on their side because they don't know anymore who they can and can't trust. And so these are really the important questions that we move on daily post COVID, right? Because March 1st, I was working in an office where we were trying to convince ourselves even that COVID could happen to us. You know, black folks were specifically saying it couldn't happen to us. This was a white man's disease and we weren't gonna get it and it was gonna happen somewhere else and we were good. Um, and, you know, we laugh and smile and giggle about it, but that's real. And it's real because as black and brown folk, you just want to be missed on one thing, right? You just, you're looking for that one time in your life. It, please just don't let it be us. And I had to sit in an office with my leadership team and say, look, whether it is for us or not, 
if it happens, it will hit us harder because that is what happens to us. And that was the reality of the conversations we were having between the first and when we had to close our very first building at March 11th. So before the schools closed, before anything else closed, we were closing our buildings because we were already seeing it firsthand in our facility, how many of our staff were getting sick. And we have two senior centers. We, with, we work with young people in our rec centers. We have two senior centers and we do a lot of substance use work, inpatient and outpatient. We have a mobile unit as well where we're in the community. And the area we saw our staff getting sick first was in our youth services department. It wasn't where everybody was telling us to look. And so at that point, we started to close down because we recognized that this thing was going to hit us way harder than we even could imagine. And I think even those of us who've been doing a lot of health disparity work and social justice and human justice work and racial work, we knew this was gonna be bad, but I think what happens in East Elmhurst, Elmhurst, Corona, Jackson Heights, shocked even us. And it shocked us because it shouldn't have happened. Even in, from the idea of the disparate numbers, the numbers that happened in our community is unconscionable. And it's clearly a part of where we talk about the breakdown of public trust, because this doesn't just happen. This is designed. Thank you so much. Uh, our next uh, in line is Senator Jessica Ramos. Welcome, Senator Ramos. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Um, you know, it's still such a very difficult topic to tackle because there are so many different prongs uh, that help explain why COVID ravaged us the way it did. I want to pick up where, Z where Saida actually left off. Black and brown people in our sector of Queens are not dying by accident. They're dying by design. There are several systems of persistent racism in New York City, actually almost every system, that has allowed for COVID to exacerbate any and all small hole inside of our safety net. Um, that has allowed for our people to go hungry, to be sick, to go homeless, to be unemployed. And it's been really devastating for us. I think even though we already knew it, I constantly feel like I am in a persistent um, need to emphasize the obvious. Black and brown people are not disposable. We are not here as a commodity for corporations that want to exploit us as essential workers because we're the ones on the front lines delivering food, cleaning hospitals, and doing all of the menial work that we don't necessarily think of as essential, but has proven to be essential during this pandemic. On top of that, we are talking about neighborhoods, specifically East Elmhurst, specifically Black East Elmhurst, Eastern East Elmhurst, where there is really not even a private doctor that people can go to for help. That is a very serious issue, considering how many people live in the surrounding area and how long it actually can take for you and or a, an ambulance to get to the nearest hospital. It's not fair that most of black and brown people's employers don't provide workers with PPE, that the law doesn't consider COVID as an occupational disease, meaning that if you contracted it at work and your employer decides not to acknowledge or help you out, he, does, he or she doesn't have to. And that's a problem. And this is a lesson that we actually have known in New York for a long time because of this droga act advocacy that has had to happen even 19 years after 9-11. We know better than this. And yet because racism has been so ingrained in our healthcare system, so ingrained in our educational system, in our neighborhood, there were so many kids who didn't have access to a laptop 
or an iPad in order to keep up with remote learning. We were already a food desert. We were already a transportation desert before this pandemic. That we have been honestly dying by design because so little has been done in order to provide equity in these areas where government has an opportunity to actually enact change. Look, we talk about how bad, and, and, and I should mention, I chair the Labor Committee in, uh, in the State Senate, so I think about work all the time, every day. We talk about how high the unemployment rate is. But in New York, the unemployment rate has not met much in a long time because there is something called the New York hustle, meaning that there are sectors of our economy that have been informal for a very long time. And it's not by accident that the people who engage in these informal sectors of the economy are people of color. And so when we think about those who are having trouble getting unemployment, who have had issues getting their pandemic uh, unemployment insurance assistance and any of that, all of those sub uh, salary subsidy programs actually don't apply to a huge swath of workers. Meaning, yes, of course, undocumented workers. And by the way, we, Jeff and I, um, and here in this general district that Saida and Aneta also serve, we have the largest un uh, undocumented population in the entire state and a significant population uh, you know, nationwide. And we have very little to offer them except as usual, whatever it is that we can round up within ourselves because we have learned that as people of color, we figure it out by ourselves because the government does not provide us with the funds that are necessary in order to feed our people, in order to provide health care for our people, much less to house our people. And I say that, you know, it was mentioned before, I, you know, from our office, we run a food uh, program uh, from, uh, um, you know, getting a lot of the surplus food from for the farms upstate. And luckily, I had those relationships due to my work in the previous session. But nevertheless, um, it's, it's extremely hard in order to maintain that and keep that sustainable. We're spending right now $156,000 a month for our food program in order to feed 1,200 people every Saturday. And every Saturday, the number goes up. And these are mostly undocumented people, not all, but most, and who have no other recourse. Because guess what? We have a Democratic mayor, we have a Democratic governor, and they have done nothing but leave their lives in the hands of Donald Trump. And that is it. That is the truth. We have seen very little movement when it comes to uh, providing our people with the services they need. Contract, uh, COVID tracing um, and testing is uh, very rare in our neighborhoods. There were actually maps that were rolled out yesterday by the Queens Daily Eagle that shows huge swaths in our districts, even though COVID has been very prevalent, that do not allow, uh, that, that uh, don't provide for testing for our people. And yet we're expected to go back to work right? Because we're the ones who are waiters, because we're the ones who take care of people's children. We're the ones who help raise rich people's children. We're the ones who clean their houses. We're the ones who clean their parents and, and, and take care of their elder parents. These are the things that we do every day. We're the ones who work in nail salons. We're the ones who work in barber shops. We're the ones who clean the street. The most, we are, people of color are the most at risk during this pandemic. Nobody has really worried about providing us with PPE, very much less any economic stimulus in order to make ends meet. And now July 31st is around the corner and we go through the, up, through the regular cycle for the past four months in which we have to figure out how it is that we're going to help people. And it's not fair. It's not fair in the state where there's the greatest income inequality in this country, in one of the richest states in this country, there is no excuse for the governor to be for the government to be in such a deficit and not be able to provide the people with basic necessities, not in order to thrive, in order to survive.
that should be the bare minimum in a supposedly first world country. So I'm very happy to be here uh, with my with my neighbors and my colleagues. I want to thank Columbia University and you, Samuel, for, for bringing us together because the situation is dire. And even though it seems as we are going to open up for phase three or phase four, that somehow things are better, that is not true. That is not true for the pocketbooks of working class New Yorkers who are don't know how they're going to make ends meet and put on the food on the table tomorrow. So these are the things that we try and figure out every day. And um, hopefully this panel will serve as a way to amplify our voices and make sure that uh, our cold hearted governor uh, finally finds his way. Thank you, Senator Ramos, and I think you, uh, I'm kind of keeping on our Twitter feed here, and you already have uh, amplified uh, the message here. This is, uh, there's a lot of fire going on, on in the Twitterverse. Thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Cicerone, welcome. Yeah. Let me start Please. saying what an honor it is to be sitting here with Saida, um, Senator Ramos, and Assemblymember Aubrey. Um, really, like, we, we are all in this together. Um, I just want to applaud all of you for the incredible work that you've been doing in the, before the pandemic and especially now. Um, it's nice that, you know, in this work that is so absolutely challenging at every level to have partners like the ones we have here on the, on, on the panel. Um, you asked, um, Samuel, what were we doing uh, on March 1st? So let me tell you, use that to tell you a little bit about what, what Chaya does. On March 1st, we were getting ready to um, launch our census work. Our community is one of the most undercounted um, in New York City. We were getting ready to sue New York City for a development, a luxury development in Flushing that bypassed the Euler process that stood to devastate um, the community at, at multiple levels, starting with, um, with, with uh, affordable housing. Um, we were getting ready to relaunch our basement legalization campaign. We were getting ready to amp up our, our um, community land trust work. These are all work that we do to build power and to build trust in a community for whom trust has been broken or would never existed for so long. Fast forward a few weeks later, we, uh, a organization deep in the community here. Um, I didn't mention anything about food or cash in the work that we do. We do community organizing and we provide a range of services around economic well-being and around housing stability. A few weeks into the pandemic, we had no choice but to pivot and focus on food distribution. We couldn't exist in the community. You couldn't think about anything else beyond the basics, food, cash, rent. So as an organization, and one of the sort of few anchors in the pan-South Asian Indo-Caribbean community, we had to respond. Um, and so we found ourselves scrambling to, to make sure our people are fed um, and not just fed, but also fed and uh, have culturally available pantry products. So for you know, much of the food distribution that happened, for example, didn't consider the particular um, dietary needs of our community. Um, and then there is the cash piece, uh, the, the, the you know, everyday living expenses, uh, Piece. Um, Jessica mentioned um, the you know the stimulus package. We all know that it, it there was really no funds that were allocated for undocumented folks, and these are the same folks who are also living in homes with extra where their their income and rent ratio is completely skewed. Basically, it, it takes all that they have to be able to pay their rent and living in with multiple extended in extended family situations to be able to afford the rent in, in our neighborhood. Um, and so we have, we have um, a sort of basic needs, cash needs issue, and then a rent issue. And so um, 
you know, Jessica mentioned, uh, now we're looking at, you know, the end of the month, as we get to the end of every month, we start to get really anxious because our people can't pay rent. And there's been no solution, no real solution for rent relief, for getting cash in the hands of the thousands and thousands of people who don't, who are not getting any funds from the government. And is really, systematic way of get, ensuring that people do not go hungry. And so you have organizations, Chai is a relatively small organization um, who are having to actually take on, take the responsibility of, uh, of a mammoth job that both is about basic needs and about informing policy. I wanted to also um, uh, talk about um, the sort of community development piece of our work. Pre-pandemic, Chaya was working on ensuring that the small businesses in, in this neighborhood remain strong, remain stable, and are not, like don't disappear with gentrification. In the pandemic, we are actually, we're watching that these businesses, we don't know if they're, they're ever gonna come back online, but slowly die. There's been absolutely no real solution for small businesses. That is the lifeblood of these neighborhoods that we treasure, right? Um, and it's what, make, what makes New York City the extraordinary place that it is with the heart and soul that we all love and appreciate and all the diversity and all the great food and, and, and the rich you know, cultural fabric. It's the small businesses at the foundation of that. What we've seen here in this neighborhood is that the vast majority of small businesses have not gotten the PPP loan, have not gotten really any help. And just, and just recently with the city's budget that just passed, um, small businesses no longer have access to commercial, uh, commercial lease assistance. And so they have no way, no support to negotiate with their landlords, no legal support to negotiate with their landlords um, on uh, rent, on some sort of rent, rent relief. And so there are layers and layers and layers of how in this time, our communities are feeling that the government has, does not have our back. And, you know, we're talking about public trust. I mentioned that at the heart of what Chaya does in normal times is really about building trust, though we wouldn't we haven't framed it that way, but it is about building trust. It's about building a sense of connectedness. Today, I can tell you that our community trust has been truly broken. And it started everything from like the, the lack of information about the, the infection, the, the slow pace with which the government shut down the schools, the, um, the lack of PPE, the fact that small, our small businesses are micro businesses that are really, a, really anchors, as I mentioned, of, of our communities, don't even have any clear guidance on how to reopen. They don't know how, how to actually comply or what to comply with. Um, you, the, uh, you know, the city talks a lot about how they are providing support for small businesses, but it's really around restaurants. Right, and using the sidewalk. But for the vast majority of small businesses, for the mom and pa shops, there's absolutely, there's very, very little guidance. And most of these folks do not have, um, because of language barriers, because of just basic lack of access and information, have no way to navigate their way around all this. So I would say today, trust has been absolutely broken in our communities. And so that is a, um, as we look to rebuild, that is going to be critical. And organizations like Elmcor, like Chaya, and so many others are going to be critical in our community's ability to recover and to, to, to be resilient and to build back. Thank you so much to all of you. <clears throat> I wanna uh, pitch, I'm gonna take a few moments to pitch some questions to the group before we go to our audience Q&A. And there's a lot here to digest. And I've been, uh, thank you again for all of your, for your opening remarks. I wanna ask uh, particularly our executive directors, which is to say uh, you, Aneta, and you, Saida. Um, there's 
there are narratives that we've been really force fed about the pandemic and particularly in New York, but I think all over the country really, that belie what, what's actually going on in our communities, like Queens, but in so many other places. What would you say the listening or the viewing public should be paying attention to now, but also moving forward so that we're not blindsided next time a health crisis comes up? And I say health crisis actually in quotes because this is also, as all of you have said, it's a political crisis, it's an economic crisis, it's a social crisis, it's a housing crisis. Um, it is so much more than just a public health crisis. So what do you think, briefly, should we be paying particular attention? It might be data and statistics, for example. I think, Annetta, you and I had a conversation about this some time ago. Um, I will ask, I'm gonna ask after you all answer, Jeff and Jessica to also come in, um, particularly talk about maybe uh, labor and economics as well, but in terms of when you, I guess what I'm saying is when you all watch TV at night and see coverage of, of the pandemic, what's the part that makes your blood boil when say they just don't get it? And what, should, what, what do we need to get? I hope I'm being clear. I see Saida smiling, so I guess maybe I'm, I'm at least making her laugh if, not, if I'm not being entirely clear. So Saida and Annette, what, what would you say to that? Well, I, I, I smiled and giggled because I think um, for many of us, our blood's constantly boiling um, and boiling way before COVID. So, right, like COVID, I think we're now on a whole other level of boiling of blood. But um, I, I think if I was to say what drives me the most crazy and the most nuts is a cup, I don't even know if it's one thing or a couple of things. I think too, it's just the impression I think people have of black and brown folk of why we could see all of the folks that we've learned to become to call white think they don't have to wear masks, believe, you know, like at the very beginning, one of the things about data that was driving me nuts was the fact that they weren't releasing the data that made it very clear that black and brown people were dying and at, at larger rates. Like we didn't need it, right? Like we didn't need the confirmation, but as I said, you know, one of the things that we promote another two is the census, right? And to be counted. So for the level of power, right? Because for those of us who understand the history of being counted, when black folks were three fifths of a person, it wasn't because they wanted us to be less a human being. It's because the North of which we don't see as a particular way, wanted to make sure that the South didn't get to count us as a whole person for power. And so we promote the census now because we need to be counted as a whole person for power now. And, and that's a part of what frustrates me is just always the, the storyline, right? Like the storyline of like, this is just happening to black and brown people. And so they didn't want to release the data because they wanted to pe for people to care, right? Like if they think that it will impact white people the same way, they will care and maybe then they'll wear, wear masks. And so then we were dying and we were like, hell no, you got to mention that we're dying. And so a lot of pressure, like the data didn't just come out. We're always surveilled. Right, and that's the point of wanting to be counted because you want to be counted because regardless, you're still going to be surveilled. Everyone knows that we he we're here. You know, I heard another talk about it, and just to talk about just to talk about the government and undocumented folks and them not getting any um, benefits or any support. What drives me nuts is the storyline again that makes it seem like, oh well, they don't get support because they're undocumented. They can't get support because technically, you know, technically they don't have papers. So technically, and you know, everyone goes through that. But those of us who've been doing this work long enough knows that ADAP, the A Drugs Assistance Program, is eligible for everybody, including those who are undocumented, because HIV and AIDS was deemed a public health issue. And to assure that people did not get sick, then you had to make sure that everyone got medication. So I want to dispel that lie of the idea that because people are undocumented, the government can't support them for the sake of all of our health, for all of us to stay safe. There is a possibility at all times for any reason. One of the things that frustrates me the most about the story that's being told is how quickly we were able to pivot as a country, as a government, to release all of these barriers. So most of the majority of our work, 65% of my budget comes from substance use, prevention, treatment, and recovery work. And in a click of a penny, it seemed like, a snap of a finger, 
we were able to drop all of the regulatory reasons why people had to come in for treatment before. People had no choice but to leave their children to come to treatment or to work as an undocumented individual all day and then still have to come to treatment because even though you're undocumented, they still wanted you to make sure that if you had a drug problem that you were clearing it up for your job, right? All of the things that we know what we can do all of that stuff, we could drop all those barriers real quick. Now we, we can turn around. And so when we understand, and um, Jessica talked about the commodities, the reality of black and brown bodies and how we are truly counted as a part of the economic base of keeping other people rich, of keeping other people paid, of making sure that other people are okay while we continue to suffer in silence or so they believe. This is what drives me the most crazy. This is what boils my blood the most is that we've been having conversations way before COVID of the fact that we're dying by design and yet and still we still have conversations about whether or not people are gonna wear masks. Like, is this really a conversation when we understand what a public health approach to any disease should be? We've been through this before. It may not have been a virus that was airborne, it may not have been one, but we know exactly what has to happen and we understand the racialized aspect of who they care about and who they don't care about. And so I'm, my skin boils and my, my, and my, my blood boils because as people continue to not wear masks, what I will say is no one acknowledges that black and brown communities, we don't have to beg our people to wear masks. We don't have to tell them that you need to make sure that you wear a mask. They are the most protective, not just of themselves, their family, their community, and those who don't even care about them. They won't get on public transportation without a mask. They won't walk into a space without a mask. They won't do that, yet they are still at siege because they're going to work with people who don't care enough about them to wear a mask. I want that to be the storyline, that we continue to protect not just us, we protect ourselves, we protect the community, and we protect those who don't even care about us. And at some point, that's got to be acknowledged somewhere, that we're the reason why, even while we're dying, we're the reason why more people aren't dying. Yeah. Thank you for that. It, it always did strike me that with all the coverage of the pandemic denialism that no one ever actually went to our communities and, you know, took a poll or just looked around to see that how many people are actually wearing masks. You're absolutely right. Annetta, I want um, to, to pick up a thread that, uh, that Saida left us with. You mentioned uh, a, the basement legalization campaign and Chaya has a long history of working in a number of fields, but particularly uh, housing rights and housing justice. How does this moment, I mean the moment of, of COVID-19, highlight the importance of that work, but at the same time, I imagine it also shows some challenges as well. What, what do we need to know about how important, I think a lot of people just, just take it for granted that it, well, we need housing, but people don't actually know how complicated it is, how much we need it for not just having a roof overhead, but also for the preservation of our health and how we, you know, nurture our families. So what, how does this complicated things for you and how does it play up the work that you were already doing beforehand? Yeah, absolutely. Can I, if I may, I'd like to um, just answer the other question that you, 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 you mentioned earlier, um, which is what, what, what should we be paying attention to? I, yes, I please, thank you. Say that it's really critical that we pay attention to who the help goes to. Every American didn't need a stimulus check. We know that most of the, most of the, the folks who got the check are hoarding the, the, the funds. It didn't, it didn't go back into the economy. It's really important that we really, we, we take a, you know, we're always critical of that, right? When we talk about um, uh, addressing the, the, the rent issue, um, who, is support going to? Is it really going to people who are most in need? I think we really, and as we move forward in, in reopening and in recovery and, and in various sort of policy and government responses, it's really important that we're always thinking critically about that. I also wanna underscore the issue of data. In my community, we still don't have really granular data of the impact on on COVID. We know that in many segments of our community where the poverty rate is among the highest here in New York City, up to 30%, this is a community that's obliterated in data. 
And we know, I mean, when I'm out and about in the community, every single person I encounter has lost multiple family members or people close to them. So I think that's, that's really critical. I also think the, prioritizing things that have a sort of a, a, a greater impact on the lives of our communities, like the reopening of the schools, like childcare centers, like that's what we need to be focused on. I mean, that is going, that has a direct impact on the lives of the people we care about, but also it has a wide a sweeping sort of, you know, impact on, the, on our, our ability to, to recover as a city and as a, as, as a country. It just seems like we're, our priorities are off. Um, with regard to housing, um, we know that the housing circumstances of individuals played a role in infection rates. That it, it, there were clusters, family clus clusters, right? Infections um, in the spread. Um, in, for example, in the Bangladeshi community, it's one of the most um, overcrowded communities in New York City. Overcrowdedness and in this district is a, a serious issue. And so this is an example of why, you know, why housing matters, right? It, 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 it was a significant factor in, in, in the disease. Um, prior to the pandemic, New York City was facing a housing crisis. And organizations like Chai and many others have been sort of, have been putting forward solutions and ideas for a really long time. The basement legalization program is one of those. After a decade, we managed to make some progress and we had a pilot in New York, in New York City with a significant, and in East New York, uh, with a significant commitment from the city government on how we scale that up. Um, and could As you we, briefly tell us what, what what is the basement life uh, legalization campaign? Just briefly, so, please, just so, so we know. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, people have lived in basement apartments in New York City forever since basement apartments existed. Yet many of these apartments are considered illegal dwelling units. Many are safe, some are not. The city does not have a accessory dwelling unit code that that sort of outlines how basement apartments can comply to be up to code, to be safe, livable units. And what happens is often um, basement apartments are in homes of people who rely on those incomes to be able to pay their mortgages or to meet basic living expenses. They're often in, um, they're often an important source of income for family members. These same family members, and there's absolutely the data shows that there is um, uh, racism at play in, how, in who gets fined for having an illegal basement. And so if you look at like, there are swaths of neighborhoods where there's like, there'll be a sweep um, and you know, every house will get a, uh, every house of color will be fined for their basement unit. Um, and so, but we see this yet basement uh, apartments continue to remain an important source of housing for newly arrived immigrants, for low-income folks, for new graduates, young people, et cetera, people who need an affordable place to live and who want to live in particular communities that where they feel comfortable. We've estimated that there are over 100,000 units that could come online, that could be legalized and be legal sources of income for homeowners and safe living dwellings for residents. So this is, so we, we were very close to um, taking our campaign to push for a citywide initiative, building on our experience in the, in the East New York pilot and it's all come to a grinding halt. Um, I would say that in this time, the housing crisis with the rent issue at play as well we are looking at a massive, massive, like a catastrophic uh, crisis as it relates to, to housing and housing security and safety. And we absolutely need government intervention with regard to rent relief as one important starting point. That might, that's a good place to, uh, it just so happens that we have two members of government with us this evening. So I would like to ask Senator 
Ramos and Assemblyman Aubrey to tell us, give us a glimpse, if you don't mind, um, into what your, what's your legislative agenda? What's the future of that moving forward? Many of the issues for which you've been fighting uh, prior to, I'm sorry, Senator Ramos, were you pointing at me or? No, okay, sorry. Pri uh, both of you I was, I was, point, I, was point, I was seeing if Jeff wanted to go first. Um, oh, I see, okay, all right. Yes, I mean, both of you had like legislative progressive. Yeah, go ahead, please, please, thank you. Yeah, I mean, like we've mentioned, a lot of the issues that we are suffering through right now have only been exacerbated by the pandemic. So that means that we were already looking at solutions beforehand. For example, uh, right now, we are looking at a, um, a very big problem when it comes to child care. Uh, we, are lear we learned today that New York City public schools, as was mentioned before, um, it really will only be um, in person at least half the time, remote for uh, many of our students at, at different levels of, uh, of education. Um, and so, of course, specifically for low income people like out like our neighbors here, um, you know, it doesn't leave people with many options. Um, it sounds like, you know, you, you either get to stay at home with your kids and don't work or you got to go to work and you know your kids are screwed and that's a really big problem uh we, we were already in it had a child care issue before the pandemic but that will be true increasingly so uh so before the pandemic i had a bill called nyc under three which is a payroll tax for the top five percent of businesses in new york and it would provide affordable child care for every single child in New York City under three years old. Um, the issue with that bill, of course, is that um, the need is only greater now, and now our team is back at work trying to figure out if we can, uh, if, if we can do it in a way that we can um, raise the age of children service, meaning that we would be able to provide childcare for children above three years old, um, but also, are we able to provide universal child care? Um, and, and, and it's just, it's very important to, I think, point out that while the four of us are here telling you guys about the dire straits in our community, that is not true for every New Yorker. Before the pandemic, New York State had 112 billionaires more than any other place in the world, including Abu Dhabi, where apparently everybody thinks rich people live. Nope, it's right here in New York State. We had 112 billionaires, and guess how many we have now after the pandemic? 118, and collectively, their wealth grew by $45 billion in the past three months. That's the thing about money. Money is tangible. Money doesn't just up and disappear into the sky. If we don't have money in our communities, that means somebody's hoarding it. And in this case, it's a lot of the uh, CEOs of pharmaceutical companies. Um, it's the Lefrax of the world. And I represent Lefrax City in the state Senate. He has made a killing during this pandemic, especially as he tries to squeeze out his tenants. Um, we, uh, Jay-Z became a billionaire over the pandemic. He's back on the list. Um, I mean, there is all sorts of stuff going on for us to collectively say supposedly as a state government, oh, but we have to cut Medicare. Oh, but there's no possibility of building affordable housing. No, but we really can't provide every every single child with appropriate education. And pardon my French, but that is bullshit. We have the means in New York in order to provide our children, our elders, and every working person with the things that they need. All we are lack is, all we're lacking is a willingness in order to get it done. And we're seeing it now. All of a sudden, there is an ability in order to retrofit HVAC systems in schools before September. We've been asking this for this for, us for such a long time. PCBs and the lights of our, of our 
public schools, all sprinkling over our students, over our kids. And now there's a willingness to, and which is great. But I mean, it really does put into perspective what it is that's important here. We, of course, and not, and not coincidentally, this struggle is intricate with our struggle against police brutality, right? Because white supremacist systems are not only limited to our healthcare, they have been prevalent in our law enforcement system for a very long time. And whether you're black, whether you're Latino, whether you're Asian, you get stopped um, at, at anyone else. You get asked me, which is not legal. You get, you know, you experience a, a, a level of uh, disrespect that is not necessary. We have an opportunity now to reevaluate what our, what our emergency response systems look like, how it is that we can decentralize what it is that the NYPD does, because the problem is the brass, the problem is the culture, the problem is the president of the police union who is a racist and does not allow us to do the reforms that are needed in order to hold police officers accountable for the deaths and the harassment of people of color, whether it was Muslim people after 9-11 or whether it's been Black and Latino people forever. So I've introduced a few, um, a few bills. Uh, one is an incredibly so, and I still can't believe I had to do this. I introduced a bill that prohibits law enforcement from utilizing chemical weapons on New Yorkers. Because believe it or not, the Geneva Convention says that it is illegal for us to use tear gas and rubber bullets and other chemical weapons against people. So if it is illegal to do in, in other countries, it should not be legal in our streets. And the NYPD should be uh, completely dismantling and get, getting rid of these chemical weapons, same way that we should be prohibiting LRAD, which is the loud um, acoustic devices that are also used in order to terrorize people, which in my opinion, actually, you know, it's, it's what we've suffered with fireworks and all sorts of other things. So we are, I think, are being given the opportunity to rethink, um, to hit the reset button, to redesign um, systems in a way that, that function for people. Anetta rightfully so I, mentioned illegal basements before, but the reality is that so many of our neighbors live in illegal converted apartments because the affordable housing crisis has been so dire for such a long time. So Senator I mean, Ramos, it's, it's I wanna, hard I, to limit, you know, uh, the, the, our interventions to a few things, and I apologize because there's just so much, uh, but there's a lot that, that is going on, and we need people to pay attention, and we need people to get engaged, and we need people to call the government. Thank you, Senator Ramos. I want to leave a little bit for Assemblyman Aubrey, um, and I would also encourage our listeners, uh, they can see your website, which I'm sorry, I've not committed to memory but uh, I know that you've placed uh, many of those issues on your website describing what's at stake and what you're doing about this. So thank you so much. Assemblyman Aubrey, can I give that question to you, thinking about the legislative agenda moving forward and about what, what, how do we prepare for the next you know, crisis like this one, which probably will happen sometime in the next in coming years? Um, you know, what has uh, happened in this process is we have, I've authored a bill um, that will require the Department of Health to study and come back to the uh, legislature with responses uh, uh, relative to the uh, underlying causes of death in our communities because of COVID. And that is the, the pre over prevalence of heart disease and kidney disease and uh, uh, cancer, all of those that contributed to the extraordinary loss of life that we saw and how we are to then use the resources of the state in another way to protect our neighborhoods um, uh, from any similar occurrence, but also to protect our neighborhoods from this, these various diseases that are. Senator Aubrey, I think we, you, you accidentally muted yourself there. And so uh, I'm looking forward to pushing the administration 
to do this work and to create an honest document. The problems of power in our state and where power resides have been with us forever. It is an American problem that goes back to the founding of this country. Power reserved for certain people and excluded from others. Um, even though we arrive at a time now, uh, you know, so many years later, the process of what that power struggle has been, basically seeing itself in racial terms, but also uh, uh, against women, against poor whites, uh, power has always been used by those who had the wealth in order to maintain their position. And so quite frankly, that is who America is. And I think what has happened both with the pandemic and also the Black Lives Matter issue as well as the, the All Lives Matter issue, if you look at what happens in Black communities, is that people have become aware of, again, of this uh, dichotomy that exists in our country. And quite frankly, it has never gone away. We have fought it at different times in my lifetime and the lifetimes of my ancestors. Uh, and so we're still fighting. And, and I, you know, I certainly uh, love to hear the passion of my fellow uh, electeds as well as young people for taking this fight to another level. Um, I only know that it is a passion that has existed in our communities for a very long time. All, and in, at every level, it's not a new passion. It is a re-emerging passion, a, a re-emerging because we have gotten to take a look at ourselves, because we stopped the world and added technology that allows you to see these acts in person. But they're, quite frankly, as dramatic as they are and as horrifying as they are, they were certainly no more horrifying than what went on in Selma or what happened to you know, the three students who were uh, down working for the freedom of the black people to vote uh, who were from Queens. We have seen the death of people who want to change society. It's just that we had never seen it in time in real life. And I think that has shaken the American populace, most of them, not all, obviously, we clearly know that they're opposing us, but has shaken them to say, you know, this isn't what I thought it to be. And so, you know, we're going to push that. Uh, the police reforms that we uh, passed in the last um, month or two in the assembly, as well as those that were passed by the city council, all set the table for this, but they're gonna be fought against, as you see the, the police unions uh, is gonna fight them tooth and nail because they feel that it is their right to do so. Not that they are employees of the people, that they are the determiners of the people of what is right and wrong. And so that is a battle we must all engage in. They work for this us. might be a work for them. Thank you so much, Assemblyman Aubrey. This uh, we do have a few minutes left. I, I would like to get at least one question from uh, the the chat room has been filling up with questions. And so my colleague uh, Kavita Sivarama Krishna, I believe she Kavita, are you there with us? Or maybe it's Melinda. Yes, I'm there, sir. Yes. Hey, how so, are you? Good, good, very good. So I, we've got a ton of questions and excellent questions. So I want to start with something which is specific, uh, where we have a question really asking about how would, how would our rights and benefits be affected if COVID-19 was labeled an occupational hazard for essential workers? This is, I think, specifically tying up with what Senator Ramos pointed out. And uh, I think it really branches out into the questions about labor and uh, service workers. Yeah, thank you so much. I wanted to ask you that question as well, Senator Ramos, but I would also, if you if just, if just briefly answer, because I would also like, to, if possible, maybe um, Saida and Aneta might be able to have some insights about the, the, the labor demographics of the populations with whom they work and how they would be affected. Um, 
so I guess I'll, I'll get started um, to say that uh, what we found um, as a result of the pandemic is that we need a real modernization of labor law in New York State. Um, as, as is being discussed, we need to make COVID an occupational disease so that any worker who has contracted the uh, virus on the job is able to access workman's compensation, uh, especially during a time when so many businesses uh, have failed, are failing, aren't expected to reopen, are closed to the brink of bankruptcy. It is critical that we provide these workers with that safety net. Um, also, uh, the uh, definition of essential workers in state law is not accurate. Uh, we learned during this pandemic that people who help us with um, accessing food, uh, people who um, take care of our children are also essential workers uh, when push comes to shove. And so they should be able to get to the front of the line as well when they need childcare and when they need resources like PPE, which is such a problem that we have seen across the board, even with multi-billion dollar corporations that are not providing their workers with the appropriate protection. Um, and so uh, that among many other uh, among many other ideas that we have, we want to make sure that we are modernizing labor law in order to keep up uh, with our needs, especially as the economy starts changing into a much more digital marketplace and uh, workplaces begin to be a lot more remote, right? I, I mean, and, and I don't want to get into a whole different other panel discussion of, about what the future of work is going to look like, but we do need to start thinking about serious commitments to workforce development. Um, if I may, just one more criticism of the governor. Um, is that people have been home for the past three, four months and have not had access to any online certifications or workforce development or skills training in order to keep themselves marketable for the economy that is changing and that is coming. So there's a lot of work to do, um, and um, and 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 I'm down and I'm down to do it and 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 hopefully be able to count on you guys to help us get it done. Um, uh, and I, um, you know, we, we had legalized e-bikes for our delivery workers so that they had, they could be, uh, not, you know, they wouldn't be harassed by the NYPD anymore and a lot more, but there's just so much more to do in order to protect people of color in the workplace. Make sure at Amazon in our warehouse here in the district, um, they didn't, Amazon did not notify workers when people got sick, when work, when uh, work stations were disinfected. Um, there is a series of OSHA violations that need to be fixed, that need to be codified. Um, and that's the work that we're looking to do over the next few months. Thank you so much. I think I did say I wanted to hear from Annette and Saeed on that, but actually Kavita, can we go to perhaps another question that they might answer just to get some, if we can find another question to, to put for discussion before we have to conclude. Right, I think there's one, one aspect which um, wasn't quite brought up, which some people have been interested in, which is um, how are environmental stressors like air pollution and heat stress, how do they interact with COVID, especially with older people and older communities considering cooling centers where it's very hard to maintain, maintain social distancing. So uh, I, I thought it's, it's an aspect which we haven't really covered in this, uh, which we could really build on. And there's a huge kind of concern, if I could add to that question, also um, uh, Sam about uh, social distancing itself in these families. And I think Aneta brought that up. So what is, what is the solution to this? I think a lot of people are asking what is the way forward if there's a second wave? All right, I'll say Ms. Citron and Ms. Dunstan, uh, do one of you want to take a stab at that? I'll just say that, um, you know, we're seeing here in Jackson Heights that people are taking more risks because it's hot. Um, there is a concern in the reopening. I mean, we're thinking about it in our office um, about the the risks to um, the you know HVAC systems and the how that promotes the the spread. Um, I think it's just another one of those um, uh, examples of how people of color are so. Um, so so threatened and so at risk and another one of those sort of like indicators or factors that you know increases um the the health the health risks here 
So yeah, I, I don't really have that much to say, only to say that I think it's, it's, it's a huge problem. And, it, you know, heat was a problem before. It's still a problem. We've had incredibly hot weather um, and people are suffering in, you know, they're suffering and putting themselves at risk. Um, Sam, I just, I would say just to the idea of environmental structures is, it's the same story. Like I, I you know, I'm gonna kind of always pivot back to this, to the same statement of when we looked at the amount of the study that was done about asthma in NYCHA, right? Like the environmental structures that exist that people are just more prone to be ill. Um, they're just more prone to be sick just by the way that things are structured. Um, the great science of urban planning, uh, that is a science. And so when I say it's designed, I'm saying it's a science, right? It is something perfectly designed that placed people in certain situations in certain ways and left there. So of course the environmental issues are uh, a part of why we are more prone, but I think um, the one thing that we haven't touched on and we're, we're not a time to, and a place to even really address it. Jeff talked about it when he talked about power. Jessica talked about it when she talked about the billionaires. The reality of it is I'm gonna use that ugly word that people don't like to hear in a political structure about socialism. Um, my family is from Trinidad. It is a third world quote unquote country, eight people died. So, I, I don't know, maybe if we distributed wealth a different way, maybe if we did handle money a particular way, maybe if people actually did have health care that was free, maybe if you actually did take care of your people at a retirement age that was real, maybe if you did all of those things that were actually the concepts that people were supposed to create democracy upon, because I think people make the mistake of of connecting capitalism with democracy. They are not simultaneous and they are not the same. It's not democratic to think that it's okay to live well and have other people live less than. It's supposed to be the less of the, the least of us that we take care of first. So the reality of it is when we talk about the environmental structures, they are part of this great, wonderfully designed systematic thing that was created and is and just said it is very American, but it's not only American. And I want to make sure that we don't ever forget that because America was created by by folks who came from other parts of the world who actually then perpetrated that behavior throughout the entire diaspora as a person who happens to be of a family from the Caribbean. I happen to know exactly what white supremacy has done globally. And I think that that is one of the things that we can keep our minds on in places like Columbia University. What a better place for us to say this, that the education that people get about what has happened what continues to happen, the way that we educate and teach people the realities of what is, will have us have a different conversation. Because the last I checked, urban planning is taught in universities. And so I know and I hold accountable the education system of where people are taught to believe that these are not real, that this is not something that has been designed and structurally created, and it has been. Whiteness was created, and so was the rest of this. And so when we talk about environmental structures, I don't even know which part of the environment we're really talking about. Thank you so much. I think on that note, we have hit, we're a little bit past our time. Thank you so much, uh, Assemblyman Aubrey, Saida Dunstan, uh, Senator Jessica Ramos, and Aneta Sucharan. This has been a fantastic discussion. Um, we will continue to look at your work for leadership and examples of what we should do moving forward. And uh, you always uh, are welcome here at Columbia University. So thank you so much for joining us. Be safe and be well. And uh, thank you again so much. Take care. Good night.